as its great green globs of greasy, grimy gopher guts, mutilated monkey meat, little tiny birdie's feet. There are some little tiny birdie's feet right there. <laughs> and then I had it in my head for two days. Yeah. It was awesome. Hey, Maniacs. It's Midsummer Maniacs. Episode 28, covering Birds of Prey. Season 6, Episode 5. Yes, Midsummer Maniacs is a podcast dedicated to the ITV series Midsummer Murders. Each week we dig into an episode of the show, including the murders, the mayhem, the loonies, and everything else we love. I'm Sarah. And I'm Mark. And just a warning, if... Uh, your kids are, it's, the show is too much for your kids, the podcast is too, but if you let your kids watch the show, they should be able to listen to us gabble on for a while. If your kids watch the show, they're our kind of kids. Yes, they are our kind of kids. <laughs> this is the penultimate Troy episode. Yes, we've been doing this podcast long enough now that Troy is moving on, which seems like it was going to be forever we got to this point, and now we're here already. Yeah. So next week's episode will be the last Troy episode. Yes, The Green Man, Season 7, Episode 1. We're going to try to do something a little bit special to yes. celebrate Daniel, Troy. Daniel Casey's amazing run on Midsummer. And in anticipation of that, if you'd like to send us your favorite Troy moment from 28 episodes. Yeah. What made, <laughs> what made you fall in love with Troy? Yeah. What do you like? What's your favorite Troy moment? And we will in, maybe we'll include that. In the episode for yes, next week. maybe. So this episode is filmed in October and November of 2002, broadcast on the 31st of January in 2003, which seems to be a common occurrence. The sort of late January, February, we get new midsummers like we're doing right now in England. Mm -hmm. uh, 9.32 million views, directed by Jeremy Silverstone and written by Mark Russell. Yeah, and there, and there, um, there wasn't anything too crazy this week in the news that mentioned Midsummer. I always pay attention to that. I've been finding some gems lately, but nothing too nutsy. No, nothing too nutsy. So I think we can dive right in. Does this episode have a village? Yes, it's in Midsummer Magna. It is Midsummer Magna because mm -hmm. I didn't get any references. Yep, they mention oh, it. Okay, Midsummer Magna. Okay, so let's head right in, and we start with nighttime broca. <laughs> We're at Edmonton Manor. Yes. Home of Mallory and Charles Edmonton. And Julian Shepard is sneaking on to the estate. Yeah. He's being stealthy. Um, he's got really bad hair. He has, well, luckily, he conditions. <laughs> It's more the color of his hair I'm concerned about. It's very, very yellow. The the moment in his bathtub later on where he's looking at the soap, uh, the shampoo bottle and rubbing his hair is so creepy. His whole bathroom's creepy. Yeah. We'll get there in a second. <laughs> so Mallory is talking to George, George Hamilton. To which who, I'm like, that's not George Hamilton. He not, has no tan. He's not that George Hamilton. No. <laughs> he's not children of the night, shut up. Yes. He's not that George Hamilton. Um, and uh, she's giving him a stern talking to, and then he heads off, and Julian climbs up the scaffolding that's conveniently placed for him to get into well, Charles' notes, attic room. From my notes directly, luckily there was convenient scaffolding there. Mm -hmm. And then there's a fridge full of dead things. Yeah. So let's handle Charles and then let's talk about the barn. Okay. So Charles is Mallory's husband. Yes. Now, I remember the first time I saw this episode later on when Mallory is talking to her sister, Naomi, and she says something about your husband. And I'm like, what? Yeah. She's I thought, married to him. I, I thought, thought that was their dad. I thought that was their dad too. So she's keeping her husband up in an attic room with his train set and his blueprints and his yeah. very, very old tiny computer. Yes, all those things. And Julian breaks in to say, I've invested in your company and I need my money back. Yep. And he's desperate to get he his money back. absolutely desperate. And Charles is like delusional to the last. He's like, you're going to make a fortune, young man. 
my simple invention to support travel and live in a perfect environment without fuels, without pollution. It's scooters. <laughs> Living in a city that has been recently invaded, and by recent, I mean uh, last year, um, by Lyme and bird scooters, I can say quite confidently that they do contribute to pollution just by being everywhere. Yeah, they're everywhere. On the sidewalk, in the grass, on the street. Yeah. So Mallory goes out to the barn while Julian's in the house talking to Charles. And Mallory has some birds. Yes. Birds of prey. I think this is a converted stable. It's Mm -hmm. a stable that's been converted over for her birds. Is this the optimum way to keep birds? I don't know. I don't know either. But that barn has some beautiful leaded windows. Yeah. The windows and brickwork on those that barn are better than what we have on our house. That's yeah. for sure. And we have two weird stained glass windows inside of our house. <laughs> Between rooms. <laughs> They're not even on outside walls. No, but we don't have any round ones. No. She's got round windows. So she's got falcons and um, osprey hawks and... Yes. They wear those little helmets, and I wanted to know about those little helmets. They're hoods. They're not helmets. It's not like they're hockey players. But they are kind of like a helmet. Yeah. They, they, call, them, they call them blinders. Now I see birds dressed up like hockey players. <laughs> well, as long as they didn't need to see you to play hockey, they'd be just fine because they're blinders. Well, my team can't see anyway. And I wanted to know why they wear them. Yeah. Because if I were a hawk, I wouldn't want you to strap a kangaroo skin, because that's the preferred material. Oh. A kangaroo skin blinder on my head so that I couldn't see anything. I like, think that would make that me upset. Freak them out? Actually, it's the opposite. Okay. So these blinders, they also call them hoods. Okay. You're right, not helmets. They prevent the bird from seeing sudden movement. Okay. Which is stressful to them. They don't like sudden movement and they don't like sudden changes in light. Okay. So they keep the hoods on them when they're moving them, especially, to prevent them from being stressed out. Oh, okay. And startling them. They do that with horses, too. Yeah. Well, the blinders on horses keep their eyes forward. Yeah. Right? But these... Cover their eyes. They cover their eyes completely, right? So it makes them feel safe. And that knot on the top that looks like stupid decoration is actually a handle. Oh, so you can move them. It's to move it forward or back on their head to position it just because it has to be just right or it will rub on their beak and stuff. And the things that stick out in the back that look like little prongy things, those are also handles. They actually cinch up a little bit of leather cord that goes along the back that keeps the blinder on. Oh, okay. So there it's are like, many, many styles of these blinders. It's like a visor with a blast shield down so they can use the force with it. Yeah, that's okay. it. You got it. Okay, cool. Why didn't I think of that? Excellent. She is feeding the birds, and she goes into her little fridge full of carnage. Okay, now, wait a minute. (laughs) This is more than just carnage. It is displayed carnage. Yeah, I would have kept stuff in containers or at least wrapped up in paper. No, she just keeps it, like, on a sheet of wax paper right there on the fridge shelf. Yeah, I'm just, like, (laughs) my note is, like, that's not sanitary. <laughs> <laughs> and she feeds them little bird feet. Yeah. Like, I, at first I was like, I wonder what she's feeding them. And then I'm like, I'm okay never knowing that. It's better than what she could be feeding them. Okay. She could be feeding them chunks of mice. Oh, mice chunks. Yeah. Like you take a mouse and you cut it into thirds. Oh, I was at Target and I saw mice chunks the other day. They were probably organic, organic. non-GMO gluten-free mouse chunks with himalayan salt (laughs) pink when i saw those little feet my brain immediately went to that song the great green gobs of greasy grimy gopher guts (laughs) song yes because it's great green globs of greasy grimy gopher guts mutilated monkey meat little tiny birdies feet there are some little tiny birdies feet right there (laughs) and then i had it in my head for two days yeah it was awesome um mallory edmonton is played by kate buffery Okay. Um, and my notes, she is Miss Calneck side braid. Miss Calneck side braid? Yeah, because every shirt she wears has a cowl neck. Those okay. big, and she has her hair in the side braid all the time. She does have her hair in the side braid. I'd make fun of her hat, but her hats go from bad to worse because 
she usually wears the like paper boy hat. Yeah. But then when they go to the funeral, she wears like a pirate hat. So yeah, what is that hat in the funeral? <laughs> I guess you're dead now. <laughs> Charles Edmonton is played by Richard Todd. Now, he has had a long, long career. Of course, he's an older guy. But there's two amazing things you have to know about him. Okay. One is that Richard Todd played Robin Hood in Disney's 1952 live-action movie of Robin Hood. Oh, okay. He is the Robin Hood. And as soon as you see him, you're like, yep, that's Charles. That's him. The other thing was that he had pretty significant roles to play in World War II. Okay. Okay. So he was an officer in the 7th Battalion of the Parachute Regiment. Wow. And on D-Day, his battalion was the one that made contact with Major oh. Howard on the Orne Bridge to basically initiate the invasion. Oh. And he was the one who made contact. Like he's a war hero, a D-Day war hero. Many times over. Yeah. So he parachuted in alone. Oh, my gosh. Behind enemy lines found the bridge, told them that, like, the the troops are here. Yeah. But then later, in 1962, in a movie called The Longest Day, he played Major Howard. Oh, that's weird. The major that he actually made contact with. And in another movie, um, D-Day, the 6th of June, he played the commander of his own battalion. Oh, that's weird. That's cool, though. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Jeez, what a brave guy. Yeah. To parachute in on alone on D-Day. Yeah. Those there there were a number of parachute guys, paratroopers dropped before D-Day, right? So mm-hmm. you drop a bunch of paratroopers behind enemy lines, they attack from the back. The forces They then, sabotage and kind of soften yeah, them up then a bit. Certain, the Germans turn around to attack them and then the forces attack the beaches, right? right. It's a it's a good strategy. Yeah. But Anybody who did that alone or with a bunch of other people is... I don't want to jump out of a plane anytime. And that was really the first (laughs) proof of paratroopers in massive action. Yeah, it would have been at night. Yeah, it was in the middle of the night. Without any light. Yeah. But how weird to then play the roles of, of people that you knew. Yeah. I didn't get a chance to find out if Major Howard survived the war or not, but even if even if he did, it's still weird to play that role in the movie. But I'm I'm guessing he was perfect for it because he knew. I gotta think that that brought up some memories. Yeah, pretty heavy. Yeah. Julian Shepard is played by Robert Morgan. Um, he's in another Midsummer in 2008 called Shot at Dawn, but. Here's the fun thing I found about him. <laughs> he was in one episode of a show called Relic Hunter. Okay. Have you ever heard of Relic Hunter? Yes, Relic Hunter. I think we watched it. No. No, we didn't watch Relic no. Hunter. Okay. Because Relic Hunter stars Tia Carrera. Okay. I watched this. <laughs> <laughs> She's kind of a Tomb Raider sort of character. Yeah. Right? Except there's paranormal stuff in it. He plays this, like, German guy that she has to have a fight with. She wins. Yes. Another cool thing, though, about Relic Hunter, guess who else guest starred in an episode? Who? Yannick Bisson. Bisson? How do you say his name? Bisson. Murdoch. So this is our first... (laughs) This is our first Murdoch Midsummer Crossover. Yeah. Crossover. Um... And and Yannick he plays like a Russian. Oh, that must be horribly bad. He's, <laughs> and he's like twenty two. Yannick in everything before Murdoch is just horrendous, and then he sp- plays Murdoch, and it was like he was meant to play that role. Yeah, well, it's not a good role he played in in the Relic Hunters, so you can't really blame him for not being no. so great. He's in uh, Dresden Files too. He also gets to kickbox with Tia Carrera, though. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, that's good. That's good. You know, so there you go. Julian leaves Charles' house. He's upset. He's, He's not going to get his money. Upset. And he he thinks about slashing his own wrist, but instead decides to take a pretty bubble bath and rub his hair. His really bathroom is hideous. Slowly. <laughs> this in this scene, we don't see much of the bathroom. We see it more later after he's dead. But the wallpaper. Oh, oh. Oh, the ba- I'm gonna go on a little. I'm just gonna warn you. I've got some comments about wallpaper in this episode. That's okay. 
because there are crimes against humanity via wallpaper in this episode. So here's my first problem with our killer. Mm-hmm. Okay. Our killer is Naomi. Naomi. The sister of Mallory. Mallory. She has keys to his house. Mm. How? Why? How do we know she has keys? Do we see keys? We see keys. Um, his house may actually be on the Edmonton estate. It may be like the Dower House or something like that. He may be renting from the Edmontons. Uh, we're trying really hard here. <laughs> but I, I actually think that's the case. That's why he can walk to their house. Maybe, but she shouldn't have keys. No, she shouldn't. And, you know, bads are a bad idea, people. <laughs> You're vulnerable. Well, the only other character that we saw taking baths a lot was Brian Clapper. No, the um, the hotel uh, oh, that's guy right. with his mother. The guy with so his mother. Wow, he somebody really in midsummer in hates bath. baths. Baths this are vulnerable. This is our second bath death. Then. Yeah, you okay. get you get vulnerable in the bath. Yes, you do. Speaking El- of vulnerable, Eleanor needs some sausages. I need some sausages. <laughs> And you think this is funny at first, but then you realize that this is a really good scene from the point of view of an abused person yeah. dealing with the world that doesn't understand they're being abused. Yeah, because initially you think, oh, this is a persnickety old lady who prefers pork sausages. And so it it's emergency. No, you it, know? Is, it is. You... When when you rewatch this scene, you feel nothing but sympathy for her. Especially when she says that her sister was there yesterday and they were on her list, but she lost her list. It's like she's already, she has the excuse in her head already yes. to explain why they don't have the sausages. And it's also sort of a justification to Mr. Pilcher, the butcher. They were on her list. That's That means that we should have them. Yeah. Because if you put it on the list, you get it. Well, he's going to set some porkers aside. (laughs) Joyce has the brochures. No, wait, because I've got something good to tell you about that butcher. (laughs) Okay, so tell us about the butcher. (laughs) Mr. Pilcher the Butcher is played by Edward Clayton. He's also in a 2011 episode of Midsummer called Echoes of the Dead. But the good thing that you need to know about Mr. Edward Clayton is that he was in a very short-lived show. Six episodes a show, a comedy about, <clears throat> excuse me, a group of anglers from the Midlands. Okay. Fishermen. The that anglerists. Was, no, <laughs> the title's better than that. Okay. <laughs> it's called, Hey, Brian, it's a whopper. <laughs> <laughs> That's the name of the show. <laughs> what meeting in the BBC allowed that to happen? It's like if you took the people from, what is it, um, Talent for Life, yeah, um, that Anglers Club, but you made them sort of slapsticky and sloppy a little bit. And gave it the worst title of a show. And then called it, hey, Brian, it's a whopper. That's worse than my mother-in-law's my car or whatever that other show. Oh, it's not the worst title of a show I've got for you today. Oh, my. I can, I can only wait. I watched about 30 seconds of one episode. <laughs> If you can imagine, it's sort of like um, Benny Hill with fishing. Oh, it just makes the detectorist so much better. Speaking of awesome titles. Okay. So Eleanor McPherson, she's the sister who goes to the butcher. Yes. Okay. She's played by Rosalind Knight, who's also in A Midsummer in 2011 called A Sacred Trust, where she plays Mother Jerome, the yeah. nun. Remember yes. that? She, of course, is an older actress, so she's been in a lot of things. Yeah. I can't, I'm not going to go through everything she's been in. I, I, what I try to do is I try to pick something that is interesting. Okay. Okay. Lay it on me. She was in a movie in 1969 titled The Following. Hold on. You have to place your bets now whether or not I've seen this movie. <laughs> oh, you've not seen this movie. Okay. Okay. It is called, Can Hieronymus Merkin Ever Forget Mercy Humph and Find True Happiness? I have never seen that movie. I have never heard of that movie. How did that movie get made? It is about a man called Hieronymus Merkin who is making a movie that is an autobiography. He is played by a marionette in the movie, and he can't figure out how it should end. (laughs) Okay? Okay. 
He's a womanizer, but through all of his womanizing, he can't forget his first love, whose name is Mary as Mercy Hump. Mercy. That's a woman's name? H U M P P E. Hump. There is both an R rated and an X rated version oh, of this movie. Oh, God. Don't tell me Eleanor shows her boobies. The R rated version has a few scenes cut from a sex scene that he has with Mercy following a carousel sequence. Okay. The R-rated version also cuts down on the suggestiveness of a song because it's a musical. What? The song is called The Princess and the Donkey. Stop. (laughs) The X-rated version contains all of the R-rated version's footage. Yes. So if you only want to see it once and you want to see all of it, I guess you have to watch the X-rated version. I will post in the show notes the poster to this atrocity and the link to the IMDP page, but I'm not posting scenes. From Just this. remember, this is little little old lady needing emergency sausages. Yeah, and she plays hump. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. No, she does oh, not okay. play good, Mercy Hump. Good, good, no. Good. Can Hieronymus Merkin ever forget Mercy Hump and find true happiness? 1969. Oh, there you go. What a strange year it was. Jane McPherson, yes. her sister, is played by Sheila Shand Gibbs. And the one thing I have to tell you about her is that she was married, then divorced. Timothy Bateson, who plays Mr. Jocelyn, the lawyer, in three Midsummer episodes. Oh, okay. Jocelyn. You remember cool. Jocelyn? Yeah. yeah. So Jane McPherson, the actress behind that character, was married to Mr. Jocelyn. Oh, cool. There you go. They work a lot together. The princess and the donkey. <laughs> so to cleanse our palate. Do I find good stuff or what? Yes. You know, and you find you think A. Brian, it's a whopper is a long title. That's no title. Not yeah. when you can know about Hieronymus Merkin. Anyway. So to cleanse our palate, Joyce has some brochures. <laughs> she wants to go to Africa on vacation. So I have I have a brochure story. Mm. So in the dawns of time of the internet. When I ran a web design company, a very small one. This was a million years ago when people were like, what's a web design company? Mm -hmm. We did the website for my accountant at that point in time, who was this great guy. Yeah. It's an absolutely fantastic guy who I really liked. But he had this super posh British partner. Okay. Who wanted to go over the website with me. And I had a whole meeting, an hour long meeting with this guy. And he kept saying brochure. It should be like a brochure. And I had no clue what he was talking about. Because you were thinking brochure. I was thinking And he brochure. was saying brochure? He was saying brochure. And I had to, I call, you know, I went into the other guy's office. I'm like, what is brochure? <laughs> <laughs> he goes, brochure. I'm like, oh. oh <laughs> so, yes, brochure. Well, Joyce wants to go to Africa. This is one of many times that she wants them to go on a trip. Uh, and Tom is like, what about crime? Why does he Why does he hate traveling? No, all he's trying to do is reduce the disappointment. Because he knows as soon as he makes plans, mass murder is going to happen. Yes. And Joyce says she wants to go to Africa because she's always had a crush on that man from Daktari. So, okay. To which Tom responds, he'll be drawing his pension by now. Yes. I'll say... That's a show from 1966. You did better than me because I stopped it with you have a crush on that man from Daktari. Mm -hmm. I stopped it there and searched for 20 minutes for Daktari in Africa. (laughs) It's not a real place. (laughs) No. It's not a real place. And I kept going, this stupid show keeps coming up. It's called Man from Daktari. Oh. It was just called Daktari, and it was an American TV comedy about yep. a, a veterinarian who went to Africa yes. to work at a reserve, and it aired from 1966 to 1969. I even have a note that says, I'm not sure that's a real place. <laughs> it's not a real place. <laughs> and I can tell you that the veterinarian is not particularly attractive either. He's played by James Marshall Thompson. So you eventually did realize did, that the show was a real thing. realize Eventually. <laughs> Tom's trying to leave. 
Because, of course, there has been a murder just because they talked about vacation. Yeah. And Cully's out there because Cully's in this episode for about 0.5 seconds. Well, she's a travel agent now. Yeah, because she gave up on the mobile library. Apparently. Don't worry. She has another job in the next episode. She's a travel agent now. And he says, what about crime? And she says, it won't go away, Dad. And my note is, it will if Joyce leaves town. <laughs> <laughs> He could take Joyce away on a vacation and there wouldn't be any murders while she was gone. Well, there'd be murders in Daktari, wherever the hell that is. Because I want to see that episode. I want to see Joyce and Tom on the back of an elephant and he has to hop down and run through the savannah because there's been a murder. Yep. I def- I'm sorry. I'll be back later. I may pay-per-view that episode, man. I would absolutely I would pay absolutely to watch that. absolutely love that episode. <laughs> so then we have... Eddie Darwin, looking out the window. Eddie, 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 Eddie. Eddie is such, he's weird. He's unpleasant. He's one of many unpleasant people in this episode. Very unpleasant. So we see Eleanor coming home with the beef sausages but that he she does, knows is not going to be good. He does such a good job at being that friendly sort of person that unpleasant people are. Yes, Anton Lesser, who plays Eddie Darwin. Who is fantastic. Is very good at that kind of smarmy, nice to your face. Well, it's impressive for him to do it because he's like 12 in this episode. (laughs) Jesus. He's not Superintendent Bright, that's for sure. His bedroom wallpaper (laughs) is a crime. (laughs) Somebody (laughs) should be punished for that wallpaper. Later, when he's in bed and dead having been basically run over by a car, his bruises are prettier than the wallpaper. (laughs) Oh my, I don't know how you could spend five minutes in that room. They're like, they pulsate these big cabbage roses on the walls. Okay, so there's one production person per episode. I've been watching this. So one person has to decide a whole bunch of this. That wallpaper was probably already there. It was already there. The production person came into that room and said, yeah, this is a great place to film. This this fits two old ladies sharing a house. They yeah. would have this wallpaper. Yeah. Was it Oscar Wilde whose last the last sentence he ever spoke before he died was me or the wallpaper one of us must go? Something like that. Yeah, that that's how that wallpaper makes me feel. Oh, it's bad. He has a cabinet of eggs because he's an egg collector. Okay. If you collect eggs, you need to store them properly. He is. No, he's not. They're, they're like rolling around in the little parts. Oh. There's no like pillows or anything for them to on. If somebody does a bad day and falls into that cabinet, all those eggs are gone. And Eddie's going to cry. Yes, he will. He's very into those. <laughs> it's interesting that his last name is Darwin. Yeah. And he collects eggs. I thought that was kind of on the nose. Illegally. Yeah. Illegally. It's illegal in the UK to collect Eggs from wild birds. Oh, it is? Yes. Do you know how they prepare them, though? Because he's not just got a drawer full of rotten eggs. No, they they must, like, put enamel on them or something. They blow them out. Oh, okay. You know how that... So they're even more fragile. Yeah, because they're hollow. Yeah. Like any egg is. Yeah, those would be broken in a second. They're very, very fragile. The Natural History Museum at Tring, which is in the UK... Holds the largest collection of bird eggs in the world. They have over a million eggs. Wow. From collectors. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, in the mid 1800s, collecting eggs was a big thing. You put them in your little cabinet of curiosities, right? And I'm sure when they like uh, arrest people like doing this, they don't just throw away the eggs, they probably take them to a place like that. But the, the collection is a historic collection. Yeah. Do you know what the study of eggs is called? No. It is called oology. Oology. It's O-O-L-O-G-Y. Oology. Okay. Which makes me think of Phil from Time Team. He goes, oh, ah. Oh, ah. It's oology. (laughs) Oology. What? (laughs) What? what? It's the study of bird eggs. Oology. Now you know. Well, Troy's doing nothing but making bird jokes. It's hard not to. I'm like, whatever, 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 whatever. Oh, Troy has a book. And I spend easily 40 minutes trying to figure out what book Troy has. Well, you skipped over Eddie dropping the plate. 
Yes, he did drop that plate. Did you want to punch him? Yes. I wanted to punch him. He has a little sausage freak out. He, but not before he picks up his packed lunch that they've made for him. Oh, it's, again, I just immediately get the sense he's an abuser, and it just makes me hate him even more. How do you understand their relationship? So he's a lodger, and he had to have, at some point in time, physically harm them. But wouldn't they just call the police and have him kicked out? They, I know you don't remember this, but I'm sure he refers to something they are ashamed of doing. Like you think he's blackmailing them and that's why they put up with him? I think so. And I at first thought they were gay. And then I'm like, but they're sisters. So maybe they're gay sisters. This is Midsummer, remember. <laughs> But I couldn't figure out what he has on them. See, I think they wanted a lodger because they're both old maids and they wanted someone to take care of. And I think early on, they actually enjoyed taking care of him because he let them and that was pleasant for them. But then he started to take them for granted and then take advantage. And now they're too afraid of him to kick him out. You know, I think Troy could go live there and it would be better. Yeah, they would take good care of Troy. Yes. And he would be nice to them. He's just an asshole. So Troy is going to go off with uh, Sarah, Sarah Pierce. 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 Of the, the wildlife police. She's a wildlife liaison. Constable Sarah Pierce. Yes. A crime is a crime after all. And finally he raises the book enough that I can see what the book is. And it is? Sort of. It is <laughs> Collins Birds of Prey, but I don't know what edition. Well, I don't want anyone to think that the Costin CID doesn't know it's Asio from its elbow. <laughs> Asio's a bird. Har, 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 har. But then Troy sees Sarah and he's like, oh, bird crimes are relevant. Yes. Which I'm like, is he that much on the make? <laughs> well, she does look a lot like Cully. So she does. He's, but she's his type. She's weird. He's like, I got some wellies. And she's like, yeah. Yeah, it's not going to be enough. And it, they don't help if you don't put them on. Nope. <laughs> then we get a little scene with Naomi and Mallory, and we understand that they're drugging Charles. Yeah. Naomi Sinclair, the doctor sister of Mallory, is played by Alexandra Gilbreth. She's been in lots and lots of things. The most interesting thing I could find was that she was Juliet to David Tennant's Romeo and the Royal Shakespeare Company in 2000. Oh. When um, they were what we young people. We youngins. She played Juliet to his Romeo. Uh -huh. The uncredited fisherman finds the body. Did you think that river looked really flooded? Uh, the whole thing looked weird. The banks are like super washed out and high and there's trees in the middle of it. It looks like there's been a flood. Yeah. But we get PC Angel all of a sudden. PC Angel. He's all back. All in capital letters. PC Angel and a crane. Yeah, a big crane. Like they put that car in the water. Yeah. They may have dipped it in with the crane and then pulled it back out again, but they did. They they absolutely did that. And then they, we get Julian in a tarp, and he plays a darn good corpse. He indeed plays a darn good corpse. But he's one of many in this episode. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goody, goody, goody. Then we're back with Troy and Sarah. Yes. So now they're looking for the birds. Okay, so before that. She gets has him get out of the car and open the gate. Mm -hmm. Now I'm a farm kid. Mm -hmm. I don't like. You've farms mentioned that anymore, a few times. You mentioned that I too. I was yeah. a farm kid, mm -hmm. and I can't tell you how many stupid soakers I got on my running <laughs> shoes, having to get out and open the goddamn fence to let my parents or my father into the field. Because you had to have it because the cows would wander away, right? I literally thought I was only ever brought on certain outings to open fences. <laughs> hey, Mark, let's go to town. It'll be fun. You get some candy and a new comic book. Okay, Dad, open this gate. Open that gate. Yeah. Open that gate. Oh, like that all the time. I'll just drive up ahead and you meet me at the gate. Yep. <laughs> yep. So Sarah is investigating some egg thefts. Yes. And she's brought Troy along because it's a crime. And she, being a, a wildlife officer, can't actually arrest people. Unlike conservation officers here in the United States that basically have a carte blanche. 
yes. legally. They're not quite like that. Um, and the birds that the twitchers are looking for are called sarin. Okay. Which are finches that have a yellow breast. They're related to canaries. There's just a pair. They're very small birds. They might breed here. And they're more European than they are UK. Yeah. But they're not really that rare. They're, they would be unusual. So that got me thinking, why are they called twitchers? Why do you think they're called twitchers? Um, because they twitch. You think they all have palsy or something? Something. <laughs> Sitting in those blinds all day, I'd get twitchy. So I fell down a big rabbit hole. I can imagine. And it was quite interesting. I didn't know that there was a controversy around twitching versus... Travesty. Con, con, what, how do they say it? Controversy. Controversy. Twitching is a British term. It's more used in Britain than it is in America. For the pursuit of previously located rare birds. Okay. okay. So somebody sees a bird that is unusual for the spot that it's in. They tell their friends. The twitchers all come out because they want to see the bird. Why do they want to see the bird? Because they have a life list. They have a list of species that they want to see. And it's like collecting baseball cards. Okay. If you can know where and when... You saw that bird. You can add them to your little notebook. And then it's like, it's kind of a competitive thing. It's a collection thing. I completely understand. It's also kind of an intrinsic motivation thing that you want to get all the ones that you hope to see. In North America, we call it chasing rather than twitching. Okay. Because they actually do go and chase birds. Okay. Chase the birds where they were, right? So they can tick them off their list. Prior names for people who did this before twitching became a thing were pot hunter, tally hunter, and tick hunter, because they tick them off the list. They check okay. them off the list. Yeah. Oh, and I'll go back a little bit to say that twitching actually originated as a term in the 50s to describe one specific bird watcher whose name was Howard Medhurst, who did twitch. Oh, I'm sorry. And <laughs> I don't know if it, I think it was just because he was so excited. I don't think he had a condition or anything. Okay. So you don't have to be sorry. Apparently, he was quite uptight and tense. What kind of excitement does he get from these birds? But he sort of initiated the whole keeping of a list kind of competitive nature of bird watching. Yeah. I shouldn't call him a bird watcher because bird watchers will get upset. Okay. What are bird watchers? I'm going to read you a little passage here. Okay. Because I need to, I need, I need you to have the tone from, from the bird's mouth, as, as I could say. I'm listening. This is from The Guardian newspaper from a section called Notes and Queries. It's kind of like old school FAQs or old school Reddit. People would submit questions and then people from the community would write in their answers. Sounds like a good idea. And the question was, why are bird watchers called twitchers? Ooh. Perfectly honest, straightforward question. Yeah. Here is the response from, uh, oh, I don't know, some dude. Okay. Quote, any serious bird watcher will take great exception to being called a twitcher. There's a world of difference between the two. Bird watching entails making careful notes about the birds one sees, even if it's the most common, boring bird imaginable. It entails having the greatest respect for them and making strenuous efforts to minimize disturbance when making observations. These observations then contribute towards our knowledge of the birds, their distribution, and nesting habits. Go Such information... On. Having been gathered can help with conservation and research. That's a bird watcher. Yes. Twitchers are only interested in adding to the list of rare birds that they have seen. With their intelligence network, they are ready to set out at the drop of a hat at any time of the day or night <laughs> to, <laughs> to travel large distances for the prospect of seeing a migrant, lesser spotted scrub warbler or whatever. <laughs> This poor bird, not normally a visitor to the UK, has been blown off course by a freak storm or something, already exhausted from its ordeal, and finds itself unable to feed because it's surrounded and harried at every turn by hundreds of anoraks sporting po high-powered telescopes like a horde of press photographers fighting for a better view. The bird inevitably dies. Because this activity is extremely competitive... <laughs> The aim to have the longest list and to have seen the rarest bird, twitchers are highly stressed, nervous individuals. The very mention of some exotic avian delight, a purple Peruvian rock thrush, for example, <laughs> sends them into paroxysms. <laughs> they literally twitch. Wow. When was this published? Oh, my God. <laughs> wow. 
So if you don't want to put your foot in your mouth, don't call a bird watcher a twitcher. Wow. I Certainly don't, not. I think twitchers are okay with being called bird watchers, but not the other way around. No, not the other way around. There's kind of a tone in that. If You, you might have picked up on... There was a switch. There's kind of a contrast being yes. drawn between a bird watcher and We're a We're scientific and they're bird killers. <laughs> the bird inevitably dies. The bird inevitably dies. <laughs> And I love the blind that Troy and Sarah are hiding behind. It looks like it's made out of bad placemats from Pier 1. <laughs> yeah, it's horrible. Absolutely like, horrible. Oh, you can't see us, even though this big hole is cut in it and our heads are in the hole. Yeah. No, no, it's, we're hiding. Uh, and they see Eddie. They see Eddie and they see Moorcroft. Moorcroft. The Eggman. Sean man. Moorcroft. The Eggman. Cuckoo, cuckoo. He is Cuckoo Kachu. Yeah. He, Sean Moorcroft, is played by Trevor Cooper. Okay. Who was also in Duck Patrol. Remember Duck, Duck Patrol? Duck Patrol. Another David Tennant yep. reference there. He was also in a show called Wizards vs. Aliens. Why have we not seen this? Oh, because it's mostly a kid's show. Okay. Um, But he's not alone. Okay. Because Candida Benson, who plays Sarah Pierce, yes. was also in Wizards vs. Oh, Aliens. Oh, so they know each they other. They know each other. Yeah. Um, he was also in a movie called Black Forest Gateau, which is about a bunch of British retirees on vacation in the Mediterranean that plan a bank heist. Okay. We need to see that. Yeah, we should. Does Julian's cleaning lady live in his house? I don't know. I have the same question. Her name is Maisie Cullen. Yes. And she kind of seems to live there, but he's broke, so I don't know why, she, why he could afford that. No, How I he don't. could afford it. Be sure there's a lot of booze and a lot of books and weird pictures. Because he's a book dealer with a bathroom with absolutely hideous wallpaper. I might have mentioned that. Yeah. Um, but, okay, yeah. Okay, listeners, pay close attention. We need your help. Yes. In Julian's house. I think it's his dining room. It's a red room. The walls are red. It's yes. downstairs. Tom is talking to it's, Maisie. The walls are hideous because all of the walls are hideous in this episode. Yeah. On the wall behind Tom are two framed photographs of what looks to be a vicar or a priest making funny faces. They look to be promotional pictures or something. They're obviously not portraits. They're bizarre. They are. And I couldn't find them anywhere. And looked- I tried every combination. And I sure did find some funny <sighs> pictures of the Pope along the way. <laughs> but I did not find those particular images. So if you know what they are, let us know. Okay. Thank you. Barnaby goes to the big house, and I'm like, why is he going to the big house? How are they in any way related to this? You mean the Edmontons? Yeah. Okay. And then he goes at the end, oh, well, he called here a bunch of times. Oh, okay, well, you could have led with that, Barnaby, because at this point, I was like, why are you even talking to this woman? Well, because he doesn't want to tell her that's why he's there. In addition, as you'll see as a theme in the next couple of episodes, I didn't know who the killer was here, so I was pretty convinced it was the blonde sister, not the dark-haired sister. You thought it was Mallory. Yeah, I was kind of like, yeah, it's one of those. And so I thought that... Because she's unpleasant and nasty? I thought that the birds (laughs) attacked her at the end as a really kind of, you know... Tables turn. Tables turn sort of thing. No, no, it's her sister. No, 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 no. no. This is also where we get to see George Hamilton's house for the first time. Yes, yes. And learn that he's a colonialist ass. Yes. With a horrible outfit. He is indeed. He's like on like a red and and blue striped tie with like a tan shirt with orange stripes and then some kind of tweedy jacket. Yeah. I I, I wanna I wanna talk to the midsummer writers here. Okay. Why are your marriages so bad? Who hurt you? Who who hurt you? Because this and the next episode are all about just horrible marriages. Yeah. Go get some counseling. And please. weird sibling relationships are yes. also a theme. Yeah. Like the McPhersons are great sisters. They support each other and take care of each other. Yeah. Naomi and Mallory, not so much. Yeah. But this marriage, like, why on earth are they even slightly together? They hate each other openly. Yeah. And if you're in a marriage where there's open hatred, go get some help. <laughs> Really? (laughs) Well, then you have those couples that um, clearly don't care for one another, but are okay with it and just lead separate lives. Yeah. That's a little bit better. Yeah, but this is just... 
But Anyways. George's wife, Eileen, seems like a genuinely good person. She does. But she has his number. Oh, yeah. She knows who he is. She knows exactly what's going on. When Tom on. shows up to talk to him, she doesn't even try to cover. She's like, oh, you'll hear the yelling. Go on in. Yeah. Because he's talking to the investors who are so upset with him. There are other investors? H- uh, Hillary Carlton and Vernon Surtees. Two very angry old men. Yes. Hillary. Who- they have uh, they have a role to play in George's very bad day later. Yes, they do. <laughs> so Moorcroft puts Eddie up to stealing eggs from Mallory because Moorcroft wants viable Osprey eggs. Yes. No, I'm sorry. Eddie wants an Osprey egg. Moorcroft wants falcon eggs. Falcon eggs. And so he thinks that Eddie can steal them from Mallory, but instead what... Eddie steals is a look at a corpse in a freezer. Yes. Oops. Yeah. So Naomi has to run him over. <laughs> is Naomi just <laughs> sitting there in the darkness in the car waiting? She just revving the engine. Vroom, 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 vroom. I hate everybody because I I don't know why I hate everybody. It has something to do with money. Yes. And maybe my completely absent husband. Mm. Well, no. Naomi doesn't have a husband. She just, I, I kept on going, doesn't, isn't she married too? No. No. So at this point, okay, so Eddie gets run down by Naomi. Yes. We've got two deaths now. Well, no, three. Yes. Because Charles is in the freezer. Yes. So Julian's dead. Charles is dead. And Eddie's, Eddie's not dead. Eddie's been run over. He's been run over. And we know it's Naomi because... We spoil everything. We assume that you've seen the episode. Exactly. What is her motive now? Why did she kill Julian? She killed Julian because he was making it difficult to steal the money. Because he wanted his money back. So Charles has started a company. Yes. And a lot of people have invested, including the two grumpy old guys. Yes. And Julian. Yes. And Charles had Alzheimer's. Yes. And was not who he used to be. So they decided at some point, and this is why I think the blonde lady is going up the river for a long time. Her name's Mallory. Mallory is part of this conspiracy yes. that says, we're going to take the money that was invested in this. Charles is going to die very soon. And when he dies, we're out of here. Because I get the impression, well, we know that Charles was a very successful businessman before. Yeah. Right. And I think he and Mallory actually had a good relationship. I think she genuinely cared about him. But then when his Alzheimer's surfaces, she realizes that he's been continuing to make some decisions while he's not quite in his right mind and has ha- and has gone bankrupt yeah. as a result of it. Yeah, they have no money. So the only money they have is the investment money. Yes. And before he dies... She wants to move that money to secure it so that after he dies, it doesn't get taken back. And this has to be a lot of money because George Hamilton is only getting a tiny part of it, and he bought a lodge. Yeah. Naomi has been caring for Charles. She's been his doctor and is going to get a cut. Yes. So... When Julian wants his money back, she's afraid he's going to go tell other people he wants his money back. Maybe go talk to the other investors and make trouble. So she's got to kill him. I still don't see why she jumps right to killing, especially in the bathtub. Because that's got to be messy. She's going to see his junk and everything. How does she get him out of the bathtub, clean it up, and then put him in the car? Like, she is not a big woman. How does she drive the car into the river and get out? And then does she walk home? I guess so. I guess she does. And his station wagon, she drives him in a station wagon. She's driven. She's motivated. When you're motivated, you can do things. She's got keys to the house. I yeah. might, might as well kill him. So Charles dies of natural causes, we're told. We're told. He had a heart I attack. I don't believe that. Though we do see him being injected with things. Yeah, and, I think she totally kills Charles. Yeah, I think so too. I think she sped it up anyway. Yeah. But Mallory must know that he's in the freezer. Yeah, and, it's not okay. like Mallory thinks he's alive. She, she knows he's dead. She keeps telling everybody that she loves him and really cared about him. Then maybe not put him in the freezer. Mallory is extremely practical. I guess. She doesn't seem to be a sentimental kind of person. So I can sort of understand her motivation. I don't agree with it. But I can sort of understand her motivation. And we just need 48 hours until all the financial stuff is done. 
before we can declare him dead. And so we need to cover up the fact that he's died because he died a little bit too soon. So we're going to shove him in the freezer. But you would have at least wrapped him in a blanket. You wouldn't have just laid him in the freezer in his pajamas. Yes, at least. But they do. Then Naomi, because she never goes home, she just kind of hovers around apparently, sees Eddie, realizes Eddie has probably seen the body, and decides to run him down. Which I don't understand that at all. Because if he goes and tells, No, I don't understand done. how she knows that he saw the body. He was looking around in the barn. It's, uh, Better safe than sorry. I guess. And Better then she dead, runs herself Eddie. into a ditch. Yeah, she's not a very good driver. No. <laughs> Meanwhile, the time team jumps out and goes, a ditch? <laughs> we'll dig that ditch. Oh, ah. Oh, ah. We'll dig that Legi. ditch. <laughs> oh, we found a Roman villa. And he goes home having been hit by a car. And Eleanor and Jane have kind of a pickle. Hmm. I'm not very upset that he's hurt. Are you, Jane? No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're like, yeah, let's let him die. To be fair, they say, do you want a doctor? And he says, no. They're like, okay. Okay. We won't insist then. Vernon and Hillary get some deliveries. I don't understand this at all. Because they get a delivery from the corporation. Yeah. So somewhere outside of Midsummer, Magma, there is... Corporate headquarters for this company. No, I don't think so. I think there's a manufacturer in China or something who's built the scooters, and they've been told that when the prototypes are done, they should send them to these addresses. I guess. Did you notice that delivery man has epaulets on his uniform? I did. UPS drivers don't have epaulets. Mm. I want epaulets on our UPS guy. He sh- he should be part of a military organization to deliver things. <laughs> and what they get are scooters. Yeah, not even like electric scooters. At least they're branded Edmonton scooters. Yeah, (laughs) they're really lame. But I love the packaging. I have to say, I like those triangle boxes. They're intriguing. But why would you do this? (laughs) It just makes no sense at all. Why you would send them the scooters? Yeah, like... Because Charles really thought he was sending them... A groundbreaking, world-changing technology. I realize that, but it would not have gotten this far. It was a secret, and everybody trusted him because they he, he'd been so successful in the past, so they no. thought he had something going. I think somebody would have said... The moral no. of that story is ask a few more questions before you invest. Well, when they go back to Charles's room after this and find the scooter, there's pictures of scooters all over that room. Yeah, he's got like blueprints and engineers' drawings of scooters. And like you didn't notice that the first time you were there? Instead of a train set, he should have replaced the trains with scooters that just go around the tracks. (laughs) Ah, so uh, Tom and Troy are in the bar having a beer and... No, 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 they're having lunch with talk of suicide. That's right. And Dr. Robert Shaw shows up. Robert Shaw. And says, Eddie's dead. His bruises match the wallpaper in his room. He's a clerk to the council. Tom says that he refers to red and tooth and claw. Yeah. Talking about nature, red and tooth and claw. Yeah. He's talking about these birds. And um, I knew I recognized that. I couldn't put my finger on it. I'm sure some professor somewhere that I had before is mad at me for not knowing. I thought it was Shakespeare or... It's Tennyson. Tennyson, it's okay. It's from In Memoriam A.H.H. Yes. It's a poem about his friend. It's a very long poem. It's an Auden. It, in Memoriam's about Auden, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's in Canto 56. Yeah. He really liked this dude. Yeah. Why is Eddie smiling? I don't know. He's dead and he's smiling. He's like, why... I'm happy. <laughs> Maybe he's looking at the wallpaper going, I'm never going to have to see you again because I'm dying. Yay. Yeah. And he grins. No more beef sausages. Yay. I noticed also that the undertakers were there really fast. Yeah. <laughs> you get the feeling that Eleanor was like, he's dead. Come get him. Because Tom said, you know, don't disturb Eddie's room. It's yeah. a crime scene. And Jane and Eleanor are like, oh, you're not going to take him with you? We'd prefer if you did. Yeah. (laughs) Like, yeah, I understand wanting to get the body out of the house, but they really just want him out of their lives completely and as quick as possible. And then they act all weird about it, which if they talked to Barnaby for two seconds and said he was not very nice to us, Barnaby would have been like, okay, I understand the whole situation. Yeah, you guys clearly didn't run him down with a car. Yeah. But they did sort of neglect, 
I don't know. They, they, I, I think they had a duty to provide him with a little bit more medical care than they did. No, he said he didn't want a doctor. But, it's not their child. But when no. Eleanor change, helps him change, I think you could argue that she should have called a doctor at that point. That he wasn't he wasn't able to give consent for medical care or not. He was he was too injured. I guess she doesn't. I don't fault her for that. But I can see why they wouldn't have admitted that right away. Yeah. They go to arrest Moorcroft. What's hanging in his kitchen? Ribbons. It is a tradition. His entire kitchen ceiling is made of ribbons? Yep. Uh, Because I've been in several houses where this is, in fact, the case. They are horse jumping and uh, showing ribbons. It is a tradition that if you're a horse jumper or shower that you uh, put all your ribbons in one room, either on one wall or hanging from the ceiling. I've been in at least three houses that have had this. Okay, I get that. I get these are our achievements, right? As a family, we raise horses. We've earned honors. I don't understand hanging them from the ceiling when you already live in a cottage with a very low ceiling. Yes. And I really don't understand hanging them in the kitchen. You know, I've never seen them in the kitchen. I've only ever seen them in living rooms, but... That's what is going on. They I'm, would be so greasy. You uh, want to yeah. talk about greasy, goofy gopher well, guts. They're also Eric. not like, they're not high quality ribbons or anything. Well, no. Now I just think about, you know, some 4-H kid I know who's like showing his sheep every year and hanging his ribbons from the kitchen. Yeah, it's like that. Like, hey, we got third place. Yay. Yeah. If you get a ribbon, you hang a ribbon, huh? It's gross. I don't like it. Okay. It's not as bad as the wallpaper, but it's gross. The cops are here. Okay, I need to get out of here. But first, I need to put my coat on. Why (laughs) does he put his coat on? It's hanging there. Maybe his keys are in his coat pocket. I guess. He goes full aggro and Troy just trips him. Yeah, he's like, ah, oops, face down. Troy's like, real cop. Yeah. Puts his arms behind his back and everything. Yeah. And Moorcroft's not a little dude. No. He's a big guy. Then we get to see George super drunk. Yes. In the best outfit he's in in the whole show. Yes. He's got his African shirt on with the dancers around the bottom. He wants more money. He calls Mallory and says, I want more money. Yeah. Right. He wants a bigger cut. The song that he's singing, I'm going to absolutely butcher this. Okay. Okay. It's called Nkosi Sikile i Africa. Okay. It means Lord bless Africa. Okay. And it's a Christian hymn that was kind of adopted as a um, uh, anti-apartheid theme song. That's where I recognize it from, yeah. It became sort of a pan-African liberation song um, in the early 1900s. And then it became the national anthem of five different countries. Zambia, Tanzania, Namibia, and Zimbabwe. Okay. Um. And another country, not on my list, because that's only four. Um, they have since changed to other, yes, other national anthems. But it, it, that was that was it. And I thought it was interesting that that's what he's singing because he's so clearly somebody who just appropriates another culture yes. that is not his own, and yet he's singing about freeing Africa. Yeah, and he just wants to go take advantage of Africa again. Yeah, exactly. He's a hypocrite. He's ginormous hypocrite. He's horrible. Well, he gets it. And his wife hates him, so. Because he's moved all of their money to an account in Africa without telling her and already has a ticket on a Antelope. One way. A one-way ticket on Antelope Air. Antelope Air. To fly to Africa and ditch her. I would be extremely angry. Then, I understand. Then we have Charles' funeral, which makes the weirdest Badger's Drift reference ever. The birds. Yes, you have to go tell the birds when someone dies. No, you don't. <laughs> First of all, why didn't she tell them when he actually died? Also, we never see Charles interact with the birds. Do they even know he exists? They respected him. How? I don't know. That's what she says. <laughs> you have to tell them when someone they respect dies. And that just got me thinking about birds and bees because you have to tell the bees when somebody dies. So is it a birds and bees thing? I you guess. have to tell them. So then I Googled, do you have to tell an animal when someone dies? And Wow. <laughs> There's a lot of advice out there about how to tell somebody that an animal's died. 
I flipped it around. That's like, no, I want to oh, know about telling I people. Hate, I hate it when Google does that. I want to know like, about telling animals no. that a person has died, not yes. telling a person that an animal's died. Yep. And you put it in quotation marks to get it the right way around. And Google goes, I'm going to ignore those it quotation says, marks. Surely that's not what you mean, because that's a stupid search. <laughs> Why would you be Only searching for talking people. to animals? Only crazy people would do that, sir. <laughs> When I you've also, been judged by Google as crazy. Yeah, it, it wagged its finger at me. Um, yeah, it, it did a, a grated carrot. Do you know what a grated carrot is? No. You know, when you, you, put, you, you stick the, the index finger of your left hand out and you, you slide down it with the index finger of your right to yeah. say, no, no, don't do that. Yeah. That's great in the carrot. Oh, okay. That's a British thing, too. Okay. I learned that, too. The funeral directors at, the, at Charles's funerals, the, one, the, the ones who kind of direct uh, the hearses and all that stuff, you know, they have the top hats on with the ribbons on. Yeah. Um, just like in Badger's Drift. Yeah. I meant to look it up then, and I didn't. I looked it up this time to find out, do they really still do that? Do yeah. they really still wear the hats? The top hats. And it looked to me like maybe about 25% of, of UK funeral directors will still wear a hat. Fancy posh ones, I would assume. They are the, the higher end ones. The more, the more formal the funeral, the more likely you are to have directors who wear hats. Yes. But there's no like secret history of that hat. It's just that it's classic formal attire. That's yeah. the only reason they wear them. And the black ribbon is like wearing a black armband. That's yeah. it. Mm. There's nothing interesting there. There's should, a race. Maybe to I the, shouldn't even have mentioned it if there's nothing interesting. Sorry. There's a race to the crematorium. <laughs> the minister says, and a voice from heaven said unto me, Tom, stop this now. <laughs> it's like God said it. I was waiting for the doors to open in front of the casket and for us to see flames on the other side. And Mallory is like, oh, you've interrupted my thing. Yeah. I wanted this to be done by noon. <sighs> By the way, there wouldn't be a fire right on the other side no, of those doors. No, of course anyway. not. Why would they ever do that? The body, the, the casket would go through there and the doors would close. And then on the other side, some people would handle it and probably move it to a completely different building to cremate it. Yes. It's not as if it was going into the flames right then and there. So we find out that Mallory's defrauding the investors. Her sister signed the death warrant. Mallory lawyers up pretty quickly. She's so arrogant in this part. Before she goes to the, the lockup, Tom goes to the Edmonton house with George. Yes. And wants to see Charles's room. Yeah. And they walk up the stairway. And? The wallpaper is hideous. I, you've mentioned it. And I went back and looked and I was like, I think I threw up a little bit in my <laughs> mouth. <laughs> it's really bad. It's blue and white. There are very classic blue and white wallpaper patterns. Yeah. They're beautiful. Like nice stripes. Like willow. Yeah. And this is like... Bluebells. A little kid with a stencil went crazy on the walls. Yeah. It's just horrendous. And it's so obnoxious. I'm sorry. I'm going on about it. Yeah. That's the last bad wallpaper. I'm done. Eileen is searching for dirt. Oh. And she finds it. She finds it. And she basically takes his entire African collection and burns it to the ground. You go, girl. Yep. I'm cheering her on the whole time. Absolutely. But She's... apparently she doesn't get all of it. She misses a giant creepy white mask because yeah. Naomi has it on to kill George. Why does Naomi have the mask on? Because <laughs> like, she's crazy. She's crazy, but like, obviously, Charles, uh, not Charles, George. George would be like, no, exactly who she is. Like, why pretend? Oh, I, why not, Mark? <laughs> why not? <laughs> she is needlessly <laughs> creepy. And we there's get, spear cam. We get spear cam. And then the camera turns. And wow, that mask is so creepy in the firelight and yeah. everything. Yeah. It's like Africa getting its revenge. It is. Oh, that's good. I never thought about that. What I really like... I was very impressed with the fact that George is, he's speared, so he falls down, but he doesn't fall into the fire because it's kind of burning down now. But man, there are real flames like a foot away from his head. Yeah, he's hot. He's hot. Yeah. Laying there. He does a no good job. No matter how controlled that fire is, and I'm sure they had people all around to keep him safe, his bald head was real close to actual he flames. I was impressed. a good job. 
and he's holding a spear, you know, yeah. against him. I love how Eileen then is like totally honest with the police. It was a great sense of relief. I'm not sorry he's dead. He wasn't even a major. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so you have to wonder where he got all of his money just being an accountant. Well, she's going to clean up now. If she can get all the money back from the African accounts, she's I would, fine. I would assume so. But all that money is ill-gotten gain, so I don't think she is okay. That's true. Well, no, yeah, that's true. Because Tom says, you knew the money was stolen, and she says, I've lived my whole life by the rules, and nobody ever gave me anything. Yes, that's true. And I don't know, think she'll go to jail, but I don't think she'll get to keep the money. You know who really is put off by this whole thing? The people he bought the lodge from. They're screwed. They're Totally Cause that sale's not going through. No. And Eileen doesn't want to go live there. No. So in one evening, George's wife calls him out. He leaves, gets in a fight with the two old guys. They throw a scooter through his windshield. His wife burns all of his stuff. And then he gets stabbed by Naomi wearing a spooky African mask. Yeah, That's not a good night. It's a very bad day. And if you're sitting alone at the pub in your own seat, at your own table, talking to yourself, it's a bad day. It is a bad day. And it just got worse when he went home. Yeah. I was impressed with the old guy throwing the scooter. Yeah. He heaved that thing. It must have been lightweight and very ergonomic. Well, it was also good for the environment. Absolutely. Yes. It was going to change the world. Yep. And then we get this nice little parallel between Eileen and the McPherson sisters. Yes. Women who are relieved that a man is dead. Yes. I... I got that. For good reason. Yeah. They're relieved that a man is dead and they're not sorry. Yeah. But they didn't kill him. No. Because Naomi did it. Yes. Naomi, who keeps incriminating voicemails on her machine. Who is crazy loony. She is psycho. With no reason for it. And that actress is so good at playing psycho. And she, okay, she's a medical doctor. I have something in my belief system that she would have not been able to get it through medical school if she was that crazy. I don't know. I I think anybody who's a super high achiever like that, who works really hard, that there's a chance that they can sort of break a little bit. Like what allows you to be that driven? But they should have given her a reason to need the money so badly. I agree. Cause she's desperate. Yeah. And I don't get the sense that Mallory and Charles had been married for like 50 years or anything. Mallory's not that old. So it's not as if Mallory had inherited the family money and Naomi got nothing. So nope. she's had this grudge against her whole, whole life. But I do get a feeling that Naomi was a bullied younger sister, that Mallory was not a good older sister. Yeah, I get that too. But again, that's us reaching to find a motive. It is. And they could have given us a little, just a little bit. Just a, you know, you took all my money when I was younger and all I want is some of it back. Or... You wouldn't have got to marry Charles if you hadn't had the family money. I had to scrimp and save to get through medical school. You and never you, offered to help you me. You never offered to help me. And now you lived I've in helped the big you. House yeah, or exactly. Something like that would have been nice. Instead, yep. she's just crazy. And when those birds attack her, it is awesome. Yes. Did you watch that scene really closely when she's being attacked? No. So you get the shots of the flapping wings and hair. Yes. But then there are these shots that are from behind Naomi's head. Yeah. And here's what they did. They have a fake head with a wig on it that looks like her hair. And they've put some meat on it. Oh, okay. So the hawk will attack it. Okay. And then they move it around. And there's like two frames, if you watch really close, where you see a hand with a glove at the base of the head. Oh, it. we have to put a picture of that in the show notes. It's so fast because it's a brown glove and it's brown hair. Yeah. It's so fast. But somebody's, because they put the meat on it so the hawk will go after it, but the hawk would have just perched on it and eaten it, right? Yeah. So they got to jerk it around so that it flaps its wings to keep its balance yeah. to make it look like it's attacking. Wow. It's really well done. Well, And I'll, you got to look real close. I'll... I'll I'll use some of my technical magic to see if I can get that frame by frame situation. I have thought that maybe they put one of those weird mating hats on it. Yes. So if you haven't heard about these birds mate. If you have, if you have male hunting birds, they imprint on the human 
who trains them. Yes. And when they're in the mood. They only want to have sex with that person's head. Well, so to collect the semen, yeah. because it's, it's, it's very valuable, they wear these hats that look almost like they have dimples like a golf ball. Yes. And the hawk will come up and sort of hump their head. Yeah. Yeah. Moving on. It's it's just a wig on yes. a hat. <laughs> but it is like the birds, man. The it streaks is. of blood and everything. There's, it's definitely some reference to Sidney Hitchcock there. And then Joyce makes ostrich for dinner. Yes. And the Barnabys are off to Africa. They're going to go whether he likes it or not. Yes. Best corpse. We've got Julian, Charles in the freezer, Eddie in bed, George in the fire. Who do you like best? I like Charles in the freezer the best. He's got the most makeup on. He doesn't make any sudden movements or anything. And that's a small freezer for a dude to be in. I'll, I'll give it to him. He does a pretty good job. And they put makeup on him to make him look icy and everything. But he's not my best corpse. Who's your best corpse? Eddie's pretty good, too. I give it to Eddie because he has to lay in that bed for a pretty prolonged shot. And he's got no clothes on, on his chest. His chest is bare and it does not move. Not a second. And he's such a, Anton Lesser is such a good actor. And I think that would be really hard, not to let your chest move at all. Yeah. That'd be tough. He was completely robbed of a decent storyline in Game of Thrones, but so was everybody. God, he was nasty in Game of Thrones, though. He he had such potential in Game of Thrones and then... Like everything in yeah. the last season, they just were like, wrap it up, wrap it up, wrap it up. Uh, after the credits, okay, the Barnabys are going to Africa. Mm-hmm. That's we know that for sure. Mallory has no birds and is bankrupt. Yeah, and probably going to prison. Naomi's definitely going to jail. Yep. Eileen is free from George and his bad taste. And I'm sure she could sell the house or something. She's going to get some money. She's yeah. She's not going to be homeless. She's going to no. be okay. No. Uh, the two old guys got nothing, though. No. They're probably going to have shitty retirements. They seem like they've got enough money. I guess. And the McPherson sisters live happily ever after with whatever sausages they want. Yes. And they never get another lodger ever. And Troy goes out on a date with another woman that we never hear from again. You know, when Scott starts, he doesn't have a place to live. He should have rented a room from the McPherson sisters. They would have taken true. good care of him. Yeah, they would have. They would have fed him sausages. Yes. <laughs> You can, oh, that's Birds of Prey. Yes, you can find Midsummer Maniacs on Twitter, Instagram, and email. Uh, we also post on the Facebook groups and Midsummer uh, for Midsummer Murders and Acorn and subreddit where wherever else we can find you maniacs. Be nice to your siblings. Yes. Um, don't put up bad wallpaper. Yes. And be careful taking baths. And like... Do a double check on your lodgers. Yeah, that's a good idea, too. Send us your favorite Troy moments. Yes, please. Send us your favorite Troy moments so that we can compile them into the Goodbye Troy episode. And if you leave us a voice message, well, we might even include it in the episode. Yep, yeah, we might We'd indeed, be really so. excited, too. Yep, so. All right, Maniacs, until next time. Bye, Maniacs. Bye, Maniacs. probably going to do something special for the next episode for Troy, but... Do we want to ask people to send us their favorite Troy moment? Yeah, send us your favorite Troy moment. You want to do that at the top or at the end? Yeah, and we'll do it at the end, too. Yeah.